Hi everyone, welcome to First Chapter Fridays, episode 11. So this week's pick is Rescue by Jennifer A. Nielsen. You'll like this book if you like World War II stories and historical fiction, characters who resist or who are like heroes, adventure, and of course if you like the author Jennifer A. Nielsen, you'll recognize her from the book A Night Divided, Resistance, the False Print series, and the Traders Game series. It has great reviews. It's a 4.22 on Goodreads. So this story is about Maggie, and she hasn't seen her British father in two years, ever since the Nazis invaded France and her father has left to fight. So one day after following a trail of blood in the snow, Maggie discovers Henry Stewart, an an Englishman who's injured and he's hiding out in their family barn. And he gives her a poem that her father wrote. So he obviously knows her father and promises to set him free only if Um, Maggie and her family will lead a German family to safety. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We're going to read the prologue, which is about a page in the first chapter. Prologue, May 11th, 1940. Papa stood at the gate by the road and waved goodbye. He wanted me to wave back at him, but I didn't. I couldn't. Even if I tried, I couldn't make myself smile and send him off as if he were only going for a simple walk, not going to war. Mamma stood beside me, her arm tight around my shoulder. When do you understand this, Maggie? France needs him now. No, we need him. What if the war came deeper into France? What if it came to the same gate and he wasn't here to protect us? He wouldn't be here. I didn't understand that. If the Nazis came, we would have to defend ourselves. All this happened so fast. Four days ago, as German troops began lining our border, Papa received a telegram from London. One that had kept him and Mama awake all night in a whispered conversation I wasn't supposed to hear. I did catch a few words. Resistance. Sacrifice. Secret. Two days later, on the eve of the invasion, we abandoned our home near the German border and fled to an area known as the Parish to stay with Grandmere on her farm. She lived much farther from the border, and we hoped we would be safer. I doubted anywhere would be safe, because only one day after the Germans stormed through our border, Papa was leaving us. And no, I could not understand that. So I didn't wave. It was something I would regret every single day that followed. Chapter 1. Friday, February 27th, 1942. I hadn't seen my father for 657 days. From this exact moment, that is one year, nine months, two weeks, four days, and one hour. That's how long it had been since I had not waved goodbye. In 657 days, we had not heard anything about him or from him. Memo believed that Papa was still alive, and so did Grandmere. I was beginning to have doubts, but I never said that aloud. Life for only our family was difficult enough without me bringing up the fact if he could, Papa would have written us by now. Besides, we were hardly the only family wondering what had become of their loved ones. On May 10, 1940, Germany invaded France. They bypassed our thin lines of defense on the border, then rolled through their country, rolled through the country in a blitzkrieg, a lightning war. Within two months, France surrendered. Germany took possession of our land, our resources, and nearly two million French soldiers, who became prisoners of war almost overnight. Maybe Papa had been taken too, or maybe something worse happened. But I didn't think, I didn't want to think about that. I couldn't, because today I had a job to do. I entered, in, I entered it in my journal with the code name Female Long Throw. If the journal was ever found, most people would think I had spent my day practicing how far I could throw a ball that wasn't even close to the truth. The real message would only be found by unscrambling the letters. My mom didn't know my real plans for the day. She'd she'd be furious if she did, and for good reason. If I were caught by the Nazis, they wouldn't care that I was only 12. An enemy was an enemy, and all enemies must be stopped. That was how I thought of them, too an enemy that must be stopped. Memo believed my only plan was to go into town to sell our extra food. It was illegal and risky to sell on the black market, but also necessary. There wasn't enough food legally available in France for everyone who was hungry, especially in the cities. People here had to choose between hunger and breaking the law. My family's choice was whether to supply that food. Our prices were higher than what a person could find in the stores But that was the problem. Too often, the store shelves were empty. People were angry about the prices we charged, but they didn't understand how expensive it was to run a farm during wartime. Mama was saving every franc she could in hopes of getting us out of France, 
These last two years of German occupation had been difficult. No, not difficult. That wasn't the right word at all. They had been devastating. When the war finally broke out, Papa had wanted us to get out of France. He, pr he planned to bring us to England with him. But Mamma worried that England wouldn't be safer than France. Then the telegram, telegram came from London, and all their plans changed. He didn't go as a soldier, but I knew by the worry on Memo's face he was in the battles somehow. The only thing I could think was that he must be part of the resistance. That is why I helped the resistance. It felt like I was helping Papa, too. Thus, the female long throw. Maggie, are you ready to go? Memo, Memo called from the back door of the house. She's French, so it sounded like... McGee when she pronounces my name. But I love that. Papa is British. In public, he called me Margaret. But when it was only him and me, he called me Daisy, because the French word for the daisy flower is Marguerite. I especially love that. Almost ready, Mama, I called back. I finished my entry for the day and set the journal into the small hole Papa had dug out beneath the floor of Grammy's barn before he left. My pencil went on top of the journal, and then I returned the two pieces of barnwood flooring where they belonged. As always, I covered them with dust and straw to be sure that my hiding place looked the same as everywhere else. In the distance, the church bells rang out the time, eight in the morning. I was late today. Some customers would, would already have begun arriving from Paris. I needed to be there to greet those I knew, the people I trusted, and I wanted to sell my, all my food before any newcomers could find me. Most of them were safe, but there, were also, there would also be those who stole food out of desperation or those who might report us to the authorities if they didn't like what we had to offer. I didn't blame them when they did, not much. From the, reporter, from the reports we heard on the radio, we were better off here in the forests of the parish than in the cities where they faced a stronger Nazi, Nazi presence, sharp questions of loyalty, and were hungry, even starvation was a constant threat. I wouldn't have much to sell today. It was still cold outside, and so far this seemed to be the kind of winter that would linger, trying to stretch as far into spring as possible. Memma said that while we needed the money, we also needed food for ourselves until the first harvest came in. We wouldn't eat like the wealthy or like the Germans sit in our pubs and restaurants, but I held back enough food that we wouldn't starve either. I tried not to think about my hunger as I chose several of the softer potatoes for today, those that wouldn't last much longer. Even if they were old and rubbery, they still sell. Some people had resorted to grinding acorns to make coffee and boiling pumpkins to create a sugar substitute. By comparison, a rubbery pot old potato was fine dining. I finished packing my bag, covering our potatoes with a few school books, which was only for show. I didn't see the point in studying the German-approved books that we were now supposed to read. It was a little more than propaganda, which I had become numb to a long time ago. Pro-German stories flooded through the radio waves until my ears ached with them. Their phony pictures and slogans were plastered on posters pasted up all over town so that I saw them when I shut my eyes. The German propaganda was even drummed into our heads in newsreels on our rare trips to the movie theater. But I put the books in my bag anyway. If a German tried to search my bag and found a book he approved of, then he'd send me on my ra way rather than hold me for further questioning. I had to be smart about these things. I had to grow up quickly over the last two years and learn to take care of myself. Most of the time, I felt older than my age. I picked up my bag and slung it over one shoulder, then stood up straight, as Mama had taught me. Never look as though you're carrying anything heavy. Never make anyone curious about you. She had warned me of this so often, I never failed to hear her words in my head whenever I left to sell food. My mom was waiting at the door as I left the barn, and I couldn't help but stare. Most people did. She was a beautiful woman. Everyone said so. I doubted I ever grew up to be as beautiful as she was, but few people ever could be. My hair was brownish without actually being brown, and my eyes changed with the light or the colors I wore. I hoped that it made it harder for people to identify me or to remember my face. That was important because I had my father's courage, and these days, courage mattered more to me. As I came closer, Mama gave me one of her pretend smiles, and even that quickly faded. Will you settle food and come home quickly? Yes, Mama, I promise. And Mama, Mama and I used to sell together, but last summer we decided it was less suspicious if I worked alone. So far, I had managed fine on my own. 
I have a few errands to do today. Be sure to do your afternoon chores. My brow wrinkled. What errands? Emma hesitated, and I glanced behind her, spotting a brown suitcase on our tile floor. I'd seen it before, but Grammar had told me not to be curious about something better left to adults. Since then, I'd been more curious than ever. I knew only one thing about it. The suitcase was heavy, but whenever Memo left the house with it, she'd stand straight and tall as if there were just only feathers inside. Just in case someone was watching. These errands are nothing to worry about. There was an edge to her voice that made me my gut twist into knots. I wanted to believe her. I needed to believe her. But I was already worried, and she hadn't even left the house. Memma must have seen my worry, for she brushed a hand over my hair and smiled. There are things to be done, that's all. Things to be done? What was that supposed to mean? Memma offered often talked that way lately, in bundles of words that said nothing whatsoever, giving long explanations without a hint of information. She didn't want me to know her plans for today. As much as I didn't want her to know mine, I suppose. Memma gave me a quick hug. Hug. After I return, we'll plan a fun evening together. Perhaps you can solve the loss of your father's codes. My muscles tightened. No, Memma, I'm saving that one until he comes home. Memma nodded as if she understood more than I was willing to say. She kissed my cheek, then fastened the top of my button on my coat. Be safe, come home quickly. You too, I replied. I didn't know what Mama's errand would be, maybe buying supplies off the black market that we needed, or selling something bigger than a few potatoes. But I did know what my plans were, and I had to stay focused on them. I had the female long throw. All right, that's the end of chapter two. This book is available for curbside checkout. See you next week.